Okay, well, maybe I'll just jump into some of the logistics now. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Grace Lee. I am the pro bono director for the ACLU of Southern California. Welcome. This is our first uh, brown bag session for the summer for 2023. Um, to cover a few housekeeping details, um, for California Bard attorneys, we are providing MCLE credit for this session. Um, in the chat box, I will drop a link for you to fill out a quick form with your name, your state bar number, and then also your email address so that I can send out certificates of attendance. Um, a few other things, um, we will, we're recording this session and we will be sending out a link to a recording as well as a copy of the slides um, at a later date. Um, also, we have scheduled two hours, but um, Hiroshi has indicated he probably won't take the full two hours, but he'll just be able to get through the material um, at a comfortable pace. Um, there are also breaks scheduled in his presentation for questions, and so you'll see that there, um, there will be a slide up that says questions. At that point, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom to put in your questions for him, um, and then the, there will also be questions at the very end. Um, other than that, I'll just introduce my colleague, Michael Kaufman, a senior staff attorney with the Immigrant Rights Team here at the ACLU of Southern California, and he'll be introducing our presenter today. Thank you both. Thanks, Grace. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael, staff attorney here at the ACLU, and I'm very pleased to have the honor of introducing our illustrious panelist today, Professor Majumura. For those who are not familiar, uh, Professor Mojimura is the Susan Westerberg Prager Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA Law School. He also is the co-director of the somewhat new Center for Immigration Law and Policy, which he runs alongside uh, our former ACLU colleague, Ahilan Abulanantham. Um, Professor Mojimura is one of the most uh, distinguished scholars of immigration law and policy in the United States, widely recognized as much. Um, among his many path-breaking law review articles, he's also offered a number of books. Um, two I did want to briefly mention, Americans in Waiting and Immigration Outside the Law are just absolutely fascinating books for anyone who's interested in understanding how American immigration law got to be what it is today and some of the political disputes around it. Um, both are really essential reading and quite fun reads um, for folks who are interested in learning a little bit more about the history and how we got to where we are today. Um, Professor Mojimura is also, I think some of the students here today likely know, a really awesome mentor for many public interest students exploring immigration law and immigrants' rights work, as well as other civil rights work. And I myself have benefited from his guidance and mentorship over the years, even though I was not one of his students. Um, there's a whole bunch of us out there who have benefited from, um, from his mentorship. So with that, I will kick it over to Hiroshi. Hiroshi, I can't remember how many years have you been doing Immigration 101 now? It's been quite a while. Probably about 13 or 14 or something. I'm, I'm still trying to get it right. <laughs> Well, it is like an impossible job to condense immigration law into a two hour. I don't know if you can do it in, in 20 hours or 200 hours, but uh, it is essential and a great foundation for all of you who are working in immigration law or interested in it today. So thank you so much, Professor, for being here and spending some time with us. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. This is really a generous introduction. And um, so I'm going to um, just first thing, I just want to make sure that um, if, if there's anything that keeps you from hearing what I have to say, I, I you know I can hear myself fine, but I'm not sure you can. So um, I hope there's some way to communicate that to the people who can communicate to me that you're having a problem um, hearing this. But hearing no no objection, I'll I'll, I'll proceed. Um, you know, first thing I want to say is you know thank you for your work. Um, you know, immigration law is very hard um, at many different levels. It's it's at the one on the one hand, it's very um, it's a very uh, uh, technical field, actually, and and so we're going to talk about some of that today. But it's also one that's very human, and 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 sometimes very um, you know really um, can can put you and your of course your clients under stress. And so one of the things that immigration law requires is um, on the one hand sensitivity to the human aspect of migration, I think that's so important um, to not just being a good lawyer, but a good counselor and, and to be a, being a good person. Uh, but it also requires you to be 
very conversant with the technicalities, um, not necessarily to know all the answers off the top of your head, but to know and to appreciate the pitfalls that um, the client might get into if, if, if you don't counsel them with full knowledge of what's going on. So the goal today really isn't to go into every single detail. Um, I don't think it's possible to do that, but I want you to, uh, my goal here is really to make it so that nothing feels uncomfortable, nothing feels unfamiliar. Um, that you know where to look things up, because that's really um, often more important as a lawyer to know how to deal with what you don't know and how to fill in the gaps and 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 how to get further advice. That's more important than knowing everything, because knowing everything is obviously impossible. So I just wanted to stress that that's the goal here. Um, there's so much immigration policy out there in the world today, uh, much of it very unfortunate. Um, and by world, I mean not just the United States, but also around, in, around the entire globe. Um, but I'm not going to spend as much time um, on the policy issues here. Um, I will mention them from time to time so you have some context and so you can relate what I'm covering to things that uh, you might be reading about in the news or you'll be coming across um, in your situations this summer. But um, my, my, my main goal is to, is to make sure you understand the, the, the technical parts of immigration law, how the system works, so that you can... Um, you can not only uh, deal with clients if you're doing if you're dealing with direct services, um, but that if you're working on policy matters, you can really understand the nuts and bolts that underlie the policy issues that you're dealing with. So those are my goals here. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, so as an overview, this is just a quick list of topics I'd like to get into. Um, you know, citizenship, um, immigration categories. Uh, well, I should say admission categories is another one. Another one is inadmissibility, who fits into a category but still is not allowed into the country. Another is uh, procedures for admission to the country, but also for removal, which is a technical term for uh, what most people, I think, in the real world talk about as deportation. Um, how can someone be deportable? In other words, what would mean that maybe the government would 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 decide to um, apprehend them and, and 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 basically try to kick them out of the country? Um, there's, it's, it's also important to get a feel for what the federal exe executive branch looks like um, in terms of um, federal courts. That's also quite important. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about immigration law sources. In other words, how you do research, um, how you get answers to the questions that will inevitably come up. Okay, um, what I'm going to do, um, uh, um, I'll first start with citizenship by birth. Um, and, um, but by the way, after, uh, as Grace mentioned, um, at several points during this whole uh, presentation, I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions. And um, I will, um, and, and you can put them in the Q&A. And I just hope that I can figure out how to look at the Q&A while I have the slideshow going. But let's, we'll deal with that when we get to it as a problem. Um, so, um, the, you know, the first distinction really is is, is citizens and non-citizens, right? And and so um, I think I want to I think it's important to explain who citizens are. Or how do you get to be citizens? Um, the citizens really are the are the people uh, with the indefinite uh, right to stay in a country, the United States or any other country. Um, and how do you get to be a citizen of the United States, for example? Well, you know, one is the Fourteenth Amendment um, provides. Um, citizenship by birth on U.S. soil, that's regardless of the, um, that's regardless of the immigration status of the parents. And so your parents can be in the country unlawfully, but um, you're still a U.S. citizen uh, with a, a few, very few exceptions. Uh, the most prominent one numerically is people who are born to parents who have diplomatic status in the United States. Um, it's not everyone who thinks they're part of a foreign service of another country is going to be regarded as a diplomat. It's a smaller group of people. But uh, with that exception, you have people born in the United States, regardless of their parents um, being U.S. citizens. This, is, of course, is um, you know under political attack, um, and has been for for uh, well, really uh, at various points in U.S. history, but it's especially come under attack in the last ten or fifteen years. And so, um, but I think it's one of the most fundamental things about the United States, and and so how the United States thinks about who's a citizen and who belongs. Um, there's also statutes that say that even if you're born outside the United States, you're a US, U.S. citizen, depending on, um, if, you know, if you have one or two citizen parents, um, you might be a citizen. And typically it depends on, on the ties to the United States of those citizen parents. So in other words, how long 
typically that um, that parent, if they live in the United States at all, and uh, in some cases, um, how long they've lived will matter. One, let me just pause and just say that um, when I speak about statutes, um, very fundamental thing is that there is uh, something called the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, so when people talk about federal immigration statutes, they're usually talking about the Federal um, Immigration and Nationality Act. It's in, it's in Title VIII of the United States Code. And so you can you know look up all the stuff. So I refer to statutes, there are statutes. I'm not gonna give you too many numbers here. I will a little bit later, but I'm gonna give you um, uh, just, just a basic tip that when they talk about statutes, you're looking in Title VIII of the United States Code. Um, also, as long as I'm talking about statutes, then let me just take, uh, this is more of a digression, but I think it's practically really important. When people talk about statutes, they're talking about Title VIII of the United States Code. But here's a tricky thing. Um, the numbering is different. Um, each, each part of the Immigration and Nationality Act has two numbers. So um, the Immigration and Nationality Act, its first section is called Section 101, and it has all the definitions. So it's Immigration and Nationality Act 101. When they put this in a volume, Title VIII, they gave it a different number, and it's 1101, so 1101. So sometimes you see court decisions that'll refer to 1101. You got to know that that's actually Immigration and Nationality Act 101. Basically, there are two numbers um, for every part of the Immigration and Nationality Act. So it's like you know translating between two languages that, that you both know. We just have to realize that if someone's talking about a particular number, they may be using an INA number or they may be using the same number in Title VIII for the very same language. That's a very technical thing. Um, but it, it, you might get confused otherwise. The other thing um, before going any further is that immigration statutes, like uh, all federal statutes, have a whole bunch of um, writings that are not at the level of a statute, but really fill in gaps. And those are regulations. Um, and so there is um, volume eight of the Code of Federal Regulations. And so what you'll have is you'll have a statute and the statute will say uh, that uh, someone is a, who's born to one U.S. citizen parent and the person's born outside the United States, they're not um, citizenship by, by birth on U.S. soil, but they might be a U.S. citizen that's provided for in a statute. Um, then if there's a gap in the statute in the sense that you're not sure what the statute means, typically you need to go to the regulation first and say, oh, you know, eight, eight Code of Federal eight regulations, in other words, eight CFR for that particular section might fill in the gaps. And sometimes, in fact, most of the time, the regulations that correspond to a particular um, that correspond to a particular uh, statutory section are quite extensive. Um, and I'll also mention, I realize I'm sort of this is a long digression, but I just wanted this is a good place to to raise it because it affects everything we're going to talk about today. Um, that um, in addition to regulations, um, below a sort of if you want to think of it this way, at a more detailed level, um, there are a lot of published uh, government documents that fill in gaps in the regulations. And so you have the statute, it sets out the general principle, it has the regulations underneath it, but the, within the regulations, there might be um, a lot of the research I'll talk about later goes into, is there a policy memo from the general counsel's office? Um, and then of course there are statutes. Um, so I'm sorry, I misspoke. Are there statutes, there are regulations, below the regulations, there are a bunch of other writings, including operating instructions or internal manuals of the government agencies, okay? So you gotta look at that. And then um, as is true um, in any area of the law, there are gonna be cases and those cases are gonna come from courts in many situations, of course, but there are a lot of administrative agency decisions. So that's just a little quick preview of something I'll go into a little bit later, but there are a lot of places where you can find immigration. So that's just a digression on what I mean here by statutes. Um, but then, in addition to citizenship by birth, you can be a citizen by naturalization as well. And there's some basic requirements that are important to keep in mind, because you may have someone who has naturalization as an option in their lives. Um, uh, and, you know, basic requirements. Um, so this, you need five years as a permanent resident, but three years if you're married to a U.S. citizen. Um, three years of marriage to a U.S. citizen. So, so in other words, it's if the citizen just... Uh, if the person just became a citizen, that's not going to count. The person has to have been a citizen for three years. Um, you have to have a certain amount of physical presence in the United States. Um, you have to have a knowledge of, there's tests for this, American history and, and politics. Um, 
or civics, I say, what some people would say, um, there's a certain degree of English language ability. There are exceptions and waivers for all these things, but these are general rules. There's something called attachment to the US Constitution, no principles, which of course is, can, has been heavily contested, but there's a bunch of case law on exactly uh, what that means. Um, and there's also uh, a big barrier for some people is good moral character, because you have situations where someone with criminal convictions may not be eligible um, to uh, become a citizen. So you gotta, you gotta look out for that. And as I said, all this has details that are looked up in regulations, in internal manuals, and in case law. Um, there's a fee, which we shouldn't forget. Um, uh, getting a, an entire family naturalized can be a very expensive undertaking for people. And that's sometimes the barrier that really keeps people from doing it. Um, or put it this way, it's the barrier that keeps people, um, it's the, let me put this affirmatively, it's the barrier that uh, makes it easy or it, it makes it necessary for people to put it off. Um, and that can go on for for um, for years. It's not like people just decide when every day, am I going to naturalize or not? Um, I think people just um, go to work and get the kids to school or whatever they're doing, and then years go by. And then that's that's often what happens. Um, you know, my own mother didn't naturalize for some 30 years in the United States, and I'm not sure if she, she ever woke up and said, am I going to naturalize or not? I mean, time just went by, and next thing you know, it's 30 years. Um, so um, you can also become a naturalized citizen if your parent naturalizes. Um, so that's 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 true for many people. Um, and you can also um, automatically naturalize. This is a situation where let's say someone is adopted in a foreign country and brought uh, to the United States by the parent. Um, at the moment that the children are brought by the citizen parent to the United States, at that moment, they're naturalized. Um, there are a lot of conditions for this, but I just want you to understand that there's the principle. The reason it's naturalization and not citizenship by birth is for the simple reason that um, the naturalization took place after birth. In other words, it's not like the person was uh, born a US citizen. It's that they became a US citizen when they're brought to the United States as an adopted child. Um, but it is naturalization because it's not a birth, but it is automatic. Um, it's not like you have to apply. Um, uh, it's it's the bringing to the, it's being brought to the United States. Uh, citizenship is also something that can be lost. Um, so um, and it's related also to the question of dual nationality. Um, you know, how many citizenship? You may come across two terms. I think it's are worth distinguishing. One is called denaturalization, and that's typically cases um, that um, where the government believes there's some kind of mistake or fraud. Uh, really a fraud or misrepresentation in the original application. And so um, this was actually, a, um, you know, a, been a point of emphasis in prior administrations, but the Trump administration really went after people in a, in a, in a, in a uh, going after really old cases where it was really hard to, you know, actually even get the evidence for actually what happened uh, to try to basically take citizenship away from people. Um, so denaturalization is undoing a, nat a naturalization. Expatriation is a term that is usually used for another purpose, which is, um, you have to really intend to give up citizenship. Uh, in other words, there's a case, the famous Supreme Court case of someone who um, naturalized in another country. And in that other country, he had to take an oath of allegiance, um, basically renouncing his prior citizenship, which in his case was US citizenship. Supreme Court came in and said, well, citizenship is too valuable to be lost inadvertently. You have to intend to lose it. And so even though you uttered this oath in another country saying you'd renounce US citizenship, um, you didn't really mean to, and so we restore US, your U.S. citizenship. That was ineffective, the expatriation. Uh, but the, it's just useful to be familiar with these terms. Um, the, the U.S. recognizes dual nationality, but many other countries don't. Um, and, um, and so that's important because sometimes you have someone who's reluctant to naturalize in the United States, uh, not because of the other hurdles that they may be facing, but because they want to keep the citizenship in their home country. Um, and uh, they're afraid that um, by naturalizing the United States, they will not be allowed to keep um, their um, original citizenship. Um, and sometimes it's for um, reasons of, of attachment and emotion, um, but a lot of times it's for some very practical reasons, such as um, in some countries, if you're not a citizen, you cannot inherit property. Um, and so that would be a reason why someone would want to retain citizenship in the other country. And if um, and that might be a reason why practically they don't want to naturalize. Okay, so let me see, I'm gonna pause here um, and see if, if there are questions. Um, and 
Grace, if you're there, I'm just not sure how I'm going to see the questions. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm checking right now. I don't see any in the Q and A, but okay. um, I don't know if perhaps anyone okay. is taking one right now. <laughs> but um, nothing is coming here yet. This is a very technical question because I'm not exactly a, a master of the use of PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> is there a way I can see the Q and A if I have the? Um, I don't. Know. Okay. Actually, if you are screen sharing, I'm not sure if you're able to. Okay. Um, Maybe one of the participants with more. Okay. <laughs> put, that, put, that, put that in the, the Q&A. Yeah. It. It's okay. It's okay. It's like. I, I'll monitor the Q&A in the chat for you. And okay. Okay. And yeah. If they, and, they're, and Grace, if there are questions of general interest, you know, maybe you could. Um, oh, one, one just came in. It said, what types of crimes would bar someone from naturalization? Um, okay. So um, there is, uh, let me just walk through this with you. I'm not going to go into detail because it's a detailed question, but, but um Good moral character um, is defined negatively. In other words, there's a statute that says you that says you cannot have good moral character if you've done certain things. And some of those certain things involve crimes. And so there's certain categories of crimes or criminal convictions that could prevent you from good, having good moral character and therefore would bar naturalization. Um, there are categories of crimes, and I'll talk about them more when we get to what the categories of crimes that can get you uh, deported. Um, but basically, um, there, there's, a, there's a crime, I'll give you the three basic categories. One is there's a crime involving moral turpitude, and if it's committed uh, within a certain period of time of the naturalization, that would bar you, but you can, you can wait it out. Um, there's other, other types of crimes that are more serious called aggravated felonies, and that would be a perpetual bar to naturalization. And then there's another type of bar that is based on... Um, the length of time someone might have been incarcerated. I'll go back over some of that, but but that's the basic idea. But it's also a good occasion to say that that is, there's a, a section of uh, 101, otherwise known as 8 United States Code 1101, uh, subsection F uh, addresses the definition of good moral character. And so that's that's a good example of, of how that would illustrate. But that's the general, the general principle. Um, the attempt really is to, um, is to make some people with criminal convictions ineligible. Um, and then there's a lot of argument, of course, as to whether that even should exist or what is serious enough crime to, to do that. Okay. Um, some additional questions came in. Yeah. Um, so there was one in the chat that says, um, when people want to naturalize, are there different rules for people at different countries? Or to clarify, are there different rules with respect to how many years people need to be in the country or how many people are allowed in from that country per year admitted for different countries? Um, um, there, are, there are no such rules, at least not in theory. Um, you know, there, there are, uh, I know of people who will say it's taken my citizenship application a really long time to get approved. I think I'm aiding a background check in security. And in fact, all my friends from my own country have had all had this problem because it's the perception of, um, you know, frankly, of, 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 uh, of, 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 uh, I think, especially in the Trump administration, there was an, uh, but it, but in other administrations as well, there's been sort of a demonization of people from certain countries as associated with terrorism and things like that. And so sometimes those things practically can take longer. In theory, there's not supposed to be a difference in the in the in, in the qualifications. The only exceptions to the general rules are um, that uh, for age, um, they they cut you some slack in terms of um, the language and the and in terms of the testing. Um, and then there's some more questions that have come through. Um, I'll maybe group two of them together. Yeah. Um, so there's two. One question says, can you expand more on how citizenship by birth has been under political attack? Right. And then similarly, uh, you mentioned that the Trump administration attempted a number of denaturalization cases. How successful were those attempts? Um, the, 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 um, let's see. In terms of the, 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 the attempts, I mean, I don't have the statistics on that. I know that um, there are some cases where, you know, the naturalization was taken away under circumstances that, that where fraud was alleged. I don't know. Um, I don't have a good independent view of, of exactly what was going on in those cases and whether the inability to hold on to citizenship was based on the fact that it was so old and they couldn't get the witnesses or if, the, in fact, there was a basis um, uh, for denaturalization. In terms of uh, political attack, um, you know, I think um, I think really what happens is that is that a lot of people out there are are you know don't like birthright citizenship because it really grants citizenship, you know, um, to people who are born in the United States even if their parents are undocumented. And I think that um, 
some people regard that as a devaluation of citizenship. And there's this trope, which is, you know, I think quite false, that the, the infant the infant can petition for the parents. And I'll get into that a little bit in, in the next section here. Um, but uh, I think there's a concern that it, 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 it's really kind of a, um, you know, birthright citizenship, I think, is one of the most important things to identify a country as a nation of immigrants. And I think that um, there are people in the United States who are opposed to that. The Trump administration removed the nation of immigrants from the mission statement of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. So that's a lot of that is is coming from is kind of a, um, I think it's the number one priority for, for nativists is to get rid of birthright citizenship. Yeah. Grace, I should probably move on, but I don't know if that's, that's urgent or... or um, there's two more questions, but maybe yeah. we can come back to them in the in the next section. Okay, what I'll do is this. I mean, Grace, if this is okay, um, whatever questions we don't answer, we can collect them, and they also may come up in later sections, because because some of the questions that people have raised are great questions, but they also are ones that I could elaborate on a little bit further as we go. Yeah, I think these a lot of these will get answered in future. Okay, okay. so... Um, yeah, so um, let's let's talk about admission category. So you know, um, you're you you want to come to the United States, let's say, or someone does, and the question is, you know, what are the categories that qualify you um, for doing this? And so um, I'm going to give you a scenario here. Okay, just focus on this. Imagine uh, you're sitting in your office, or you're sitting in front of your Zoom camera, or whatever it is, and the following person uh, comes in, um, and so you know, don't. I know you're starting to get nervous here. Um, don't worry, this won't be on the exam. Um, you know, one of the ways that I can compress a 52-hour course to these uh, 100 minutes or so is by not asking you any annoying questions. So I won't. I'll just go through it. Um, Charles has been a permanent resident in the United States, lawful permanent resident since since uh, 2017. A permanent resident is a non-citizen in the United States. Um, in other words, a person who is someone not a citizen who is in the United States but is allowed to stay indefinitely is under no obligation to naturalize as a citizen, could possibly be deported depending on what happens in their lives. Um, but if they don't run into any grounds for deportability, they're allowed to stay in the United States indefinitely. Uh, they might lose their permanent residence if they leave the country, leave the United States um, for an extended period, um, but, but there's a whole law on that too. Okay, so what happened with Charles? Well, last month in Nairobi, he married uh, Doris, a citizen of Kenya, who was a six-year-old child by previous marriage, which was terminated by a, a valid divorce. And so the natural question here um, is, Doris wants to come to the United States with the child as soon as possible. So what do you do? Uh, okay, how do you process this? How do you think about this? Um, so, you know, the first thing is to think about this in terms of Charles being a lawful permanent resident. Um, Immigrants is a technical term. It's someone who comes to the United States to become a lawful permanent resident. Of course, it can be used, in, in, you know, um, immigrants can be used in a more general sense to mean anyone who, who moves across national boundaries. But um, in, in immigration law, it has a technical meaning as well. Lawful permanent residents, some people call them, um, you know, green card holders. And so, you know, people say, I have a green card. That means they're permanent resident. Um, okay, and so there's, here's some categories here. Um, they're family-based categories. Um, and family-based categories fall into two general subcategories. One is so-called immediate relatives. Uh, if you're an immediate relative, you're in a very favored position because there's no cap on how many are admitted in any given year if you qualify. Uh, who's an immediate relative? Well, immediate relative is a spouse or a child of a U.S. citizen. But the reason the word spouse has, I'm sorry, the word child has quotes around it is because child uh, can be, under certain circumstances, a stepchild or uh, an adopted child. Um, there's a lot of, there's some statutes on that and regulations and, and, and other government documents explaining this. Um, you can also be made at relative if you're a parent of a citizen who's 21 years of age. So when I mentioned a second ago that it's a myth that an infant can petition for a parent, um, it is a myth, but 21 years later, it's not exactly immediate, uh, 21 years later, people um, can become citizens. I'm sorry, they're always citizens if they're born in the United States, but um, an infant born in the United States, um, regardless of, the, of, the, of their parents' status, would um, be a U.S. citizen by the 14th Amendment. 21 years later, the statute would give them the power to uh, petition for their parent. Um, so these are, these are um, spouses and, and children of U.S. citizens or immediate relatives and parents of citizens if the citizen is over 21. Um, there's also a group of categories called preferences. Uh, again, quote marks means it's a technical term. 
Family preferences are categories of relatives that are allowed to come to the country and get green cards, um, but they're annual caps on the number in each category, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's also the, you have to provide for financial support for these categories. And so um, another way to think about this is the statute says, if you are um, going to become a public charge, um, then you are inadmissible. So in other words, you can qualify as a spouse or parent or child, um, but if the financial support isn't proven and proven th through a um, binding affidavit of support, then you, you're not going to be allowed in. You'll be one of these people who qualifies in a category but is inadmissible. Uh, um, and uh, the Trump administration tried to really stiffen these rules and make it harder to um, show financial resources. Um, but uh, the Biden administration um, basically restored the old um, policy. Um, Okay, so what are the family-based preferences? In other words, what are the categories that are numerically capped that are relatives other than spouses, children, and parents of adult citizens? Um, okay, um, so there's unmarried sons and daughters of citizens, and these are round numbers, but you know, twenty-three thousand, a little more than twenty, a little more than twenty-three thousand in a year. Um, and by the way, as I go through this, think about Charles and Doris. Okay, think about where they fit. Charles is the is a permanent resident um, and he married Doris. Okay, uh, spouse and child of a, of a permanent resident, 88,000 per year. Um, well, I, I mean, I just basically brought up Charles and Doris at, at, the, at the right time because um, one of the options is that, you know, Doris is a spouse of a permanent resident, right? So she has to wait in a line where 88,000 people are let in every year. So the question is, what's the demand and what's the supply? Does demand exceed 88,000 a year? That's the practical question that you're going to be answering when you counsel Charles and Doris. Um, and that's 2A. 2B is another subcategory of the second preference, and that's for a, um, a, a unmarried adult sons and daughters of permanent residents. Now, the reason this matters is the word child has quote marks around it. The reason it has quote marks around it is child must be under 21 and unmarried. A child must be under 21 and unmarried. So if you are a adult um, son or daughter, um, in other words, let's say you're 23 years old, you're unmarried, you're no longer a child, you're too old to be a child, but you can still be an unmarried adult son or daughter. Okay. Um, and, and that's, uh, but if you're a married son, if you're a married adult son or daughter, um, then you, you, you're not eligible. You can't stand in this line. These are all lines to stand in, basically, these family-based preferences. Um, you can be a married son or daughter of a citizen uh, in the third preference. So the first preference is, is, let's say you're a son or daughter of a citizen, and you're, okay, you're over 21, you can't be a child anymore. Um, then if you're unmarried, you're in the first preference. If you are married, you're in the third preference. Um, and each of these lines has a certain number of visas that are available to every year. So there may be a long line, there may be a short line. We'll talk about how long the line is in a minute. Um, if you're a brother or sister or a citizen over 21 years of age, there's another line for you and it's 65,000 per year, okay? So imagine this, um, a lot of this is that um, Charles and Doris, one of the options is for Charles to petition for Doris, would have to show financial means and basically start claim a place in the line for the 2A family preference, okay? So that's one of the options. Um, but notice that one of the other options with Charles is whether he can become a citizen. Now, he's been in the um, United States long enough that he might be eligible to naturalize depending on the other requirements being met and depending on what um, his prior country um, because we're not told where he's from, um, whether his prior country authorizes uh, or recognizes dual nationality. Um, what I want to emphasize, and this is just in, in really, you know, looking at this in very general terms, right now, Doris is going to be standing in line 2A, which is capped every year. But if Charles naturalizes, that petition will automatically convert to an immediate relative petition. And all of a sudden, Doris can avoid the line that she is facing if she stays in category 2A. Okay, so in other words, one option is for Charles to naturalize. 
and petition as a citizen for an immediate relative. The other option is for Charles not to naturalize and for Doris to wait in the line 2A. And then of course the practical question is how long will naturalization take and how long will it take to wait in line 2A? We, we don't have the information yet. I'll get to that in a second, but um, that's the practical thing. Okay, um, before we get to uh, sort of some of those how long these lines are, um, there is the possibility that um, that we have some job qualifications uh, with Doris that uh, might allow her to become a lawful permanent resident of the United States before um, she would be able to do so on a family basis. Maybe you know, maybe she she's a, a has enough job qualifications and, and a job offer uh, to come on that basis. So just to mention these. Um, you know, extraordinary ability. This is, these are, you know, your PhD types. Um, there's it's sort of this, this hierarchy, I suppose you could say, of, of educational qualifications. Um, the professionals advanced degrees will be the second, and each one of these has a numerical cap. Um, you might need a labor certification in this category, which means basically you have to go through a separate procedure, a preliminary procedure that says essentially you are not going to take a job away or reduce the wages or working conditions of someone who's already in the United States. There's a process for determining that. Um, and um, another category is as a third preference. Um, and this requires not a, the first, the, the first reference generally requires a PhD. The second requires more of a master's level. And the third is more of a bachelor's level or four-year college degree, plus other workers. Um, but within this category, you have uh, 5,000 workers for so-called unskilled. I mean, I put that in quotes because a lot of unskilled workers are not really unskilled at all. I mean, they, they may simply be people without college degrees, but are actually highly skilled. But the number of people who are let into the United States based on work um, who don't have college degrees is is minuscule compared to the demand. It's... it's um, and so this is one of the sources of undocumented immigration in this country, actually. Um, they will typically need a labor certification in this category. Um, there's a category of special immigrants for 10,000 a year. And one thing I want to flag is that um, some of you may be working this summer with a category called special immigrant juvenile status, SIJS or SIGIS. Um, those are the kids who basically you know, have lost the protection uh, a parental protection to, to some de to, to to one degree or another, and they may be eligible for um, green cards on uh, based on that fact pattern. Um, but there's a line for them to stand in, and oddly, it's been put into the, it's been included in the fourth employment preference, um, which kind of makes no sense in terms of the labeling. But but there is a, there is such a line, um, and it has become long. There's also investors, um, and um, that's another category, special category here. So uh, bear in mind that these might be available to Doris as well. But if not, she's going to be standing in line 2A unless um, Charles naturalizes, in which case Doris can come as soon as the paperwork can be um, completed and processed, um, assuming that it's financial support. Okay. Um, I realize, by the way, that that uh, we're going you know, fairly quickly here. Um, I admit that um, my class starts usually in around October, uh, it starts in August, late August, and we're now we're well into September, um, maybe even to mid, late September. So, um, uh, but um, uh, I hope you're staying with me here and I'll pause for questions we, as we get through the family stuff. Um, there's some, so I, I mentioned sort of the scenario that there's categories and there might be a possibility of multiple categories working. You can apply from more than one essentially at the same time. Let's see which one is fastest. Um, but there's some special considerations that are, that are worth mentioning that apply um, kind of across the board. Um, families per country limit and extraordinary bans. So um, one is that if you're an immigrant in a preference category, you can bring a spouse and child with you. They can accompany you or they can follow you to join later, as long as they're still married to you or as long as they're still under 21 and unmarried, which is the definition of a child. So again, immigrants in a preference category can have a spouse or child accompany or follow to join. Um, and so the child that Doris has, the six-year-old, um, is going to be able to come with Doris um, if Doris comes in under the second family preference. In other words, um, let me just go through that scenario. I realize I'm probably talking too fast. Um, that um, Charles does not naturalize. Doris still remains a spouse of a permanent resident. 
um, she has to stand in line 2A. When she gets to the front of that line, um, she'll be able to come to the United States as a green card holder with the six-year-old. Um, you know, assuming that not, not so much time has passed, the six-year-old has turned 21 uh, or gotten married. Okay. So that's, um, this is the fact that, you know, this stands to reason, I think, that families, uh, that someone can come in uh, and then bring spouse and children with them as a family unit. Interestingly, and this, this has sometimes been explained as an accident and sometimes as intended, but if you're an immediate relative, um, you cannot, you cannot, uh, this is a typo here, it should say immediate relative cannot um, have a spouse or child accompany or follow. In other words, that's that's a bad typo. Immediate relatives cannot have spouses or children accompany them. Um, that's just the way the statute is written. So if you come in as a second preference immigrant, um, if Doris comes in, um, Doris will be able to bring the child as a child of Doris. Okay, that's what the first line says. But immediate relatives do not have these coattails. So if Charles naturalized, and um, brings in Doris as an, as an immediate relative. That's fine. Um, but, but at that point, Doris cannot bring in the child because that's, the statute doesn't allow immediate relatives to bring in um, family members with them. But here's what saves the situation. Um, child is defined to include stepchildren. So if Charles naturalizes, by meeting those requirements we talked about in one of the very early slides. Um, he can bring in Doris as immediate relatives, and he can bring the child as his own stepchild, and that will work. Um, so bear in mind then that the child in, 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 it really has two roles in immigration law. The child is the child of Doris, of course, but could also be the, the child of Charles by becoming the stepchild of Charles. So this again is why it's important to define you know, what a child is. And I'll be sure to fix that typo before I distribute the slides. Um, now, here's the, other, here's the other thing that's important. Depending on the country you were born in, the line might be longer. Um, so I got the question earlier about different lines for dif uh, different processes and requirements for naturalization. Here's a situation where getting a green card and how long you have to wait may depend on what country you were born in. It's the country of birth that matters. Um, so you cannot have more than 25,000 people from any given country come to the United States in any given year in the family and employment preferences combined. So if demand from a country is very high, it turns out that... Um, that they basically run out of the 25,000 available for your country before they run out of the 25,000 available from other countries. Many countries don't reach the 25,000 limit, but if you are from a country that does, you may have to wait longer. Um, that's what the per country limit, um, that's what the per, per country limit does. But immediate relatives are exempt from that, right? So um, it means that for some countries, waiting in these preference categories uh, can be longer if you're from a high demand country. And I'll get into exactly, I'll concretize this in a minute. Um, but this is one of the reasons why, um, um, you know, it's just stepping back and trying to, um, you know, try to summarize these things to, from time to time in this talk. Um, one of the things that Doris has to worry about is the length of the line for family preference 2A if Charles doesn't naturalize. Um, but it's possible, depending on where Doris was born, that Doris has to wait longer than other people in that same line because of the country they're going to from are going to exhaust the visas available to that country uh, in any given year. So what does that mean concretely? Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but I also want to mention something that's that's very important in terms of immigration policy is that um, the, the Trump administration had what I think a lot of people think of as a ban on the Muslim ban, a ban on six, uh, migration from six majority Muslim countries. Um, and um, it was followed by another ban um, uh, later that uh, affected countries that were um, uh, a number of African countries, for example. And, and so the, the basic um, concern here is that um, the, the um, 
this ban, uh, which fulfilled the campaign promise that Trump had made, um, Supreme Court upheld that ban, but the Biden administration rescinded it. But the reason I want to point this out is that um, it is a political possibility and one that um, the Trump administration succeeded in insulating from a constitutional challenge by claiming national security. Um, and so um, the Supreme Court upheld that. So I just wanted to mark that as an important bit of modern immigration law and policy history. Um, Okay, so what does this actually mean, right? So we've talked about Charles, we've talked about uh, Doris and the six-year-old. Basically, a couple of options, Charles naturalizes or Charles doesn't. If he does, he can file an immediate relative petition. If he doesn't, Doris um, can wait in the second preference to a line um, with the child, who the child can be brought along when Doris comes in. Okay, um, so... Um, or it's emergency room. I mean, I, I live equidistant from the um, UCLA emergency room, a police station and the fire station. So there's a lot of sirens here. Um, okay, so um, next thing I'll show you, this is something called the Visa Bulletin. It is available on the uh, website of the US Department of State. Every month it's issued. This is the, this is the one for um, June, 2023. It has numbers uh, in rows and columns. It actually has dates in, in, in rows and columns. You'll see these are the preferences. Remember, uh, 2A is, on, is, is the, is the um, spouse and children of lawful permanent residents. So Doris is in that category. That left column is all chargeability areas except those um, listed. That means, for example, if she was born in Kenya, then she'd be looking at that left-hand column. Um, if she, and, and let me explain what these columns and these letters, um, these numbers, and dates mean. This means that if she wants the people who are getting green cards now based on being married to a lawful permanent resident, so that's Doris, right? Well, wanting a green card based on marriage to a lawful permanent resident, she's in line 2A and she was born in a country other than China, Mexico, uh, India, and the Philippines. She'll get the green card now if she applied before September 8th of 2020. So a diff different way to put it is people are getting green cards now if they've been waiting in line um, two and a half years, actually two and two and 2.75 years roughly. Um, so you know it looks like um, that if, if Doris gets into line now, she, according to this, is looking at a wait of almost three years. And so that makes the naturalization option for Charles and Doris much more um, viable as a way to get her into the country. Um, these the two th caveats about this particular uh, chart, uh, maybe more than two. One is that um, this tells you that people getting visas now have been waiting for almost three years. It doesn't, it does not necessarily mean that if you get into line now, you'll be waiting two and a half years. So, right. So it's like going to a restaurant. You go in the restaurant and you ask, how long will it take to get seated? The host says to you, we're now seating people who've been waiting, I don't know, not, hopefully not two and a half years, but we're now seating people who are waiting, waiting for, for 20 minutes. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be waiting for 20 minutes. It just means the people who are getting seated now waited 20 minutes. And so it's a, you have to look and see how, how fast this line is moving. And the way to do that is to look at the visa bulletins say for the last year, they're all available online and the State Department issues a prediction periodically as to how fast the line is moving. Okay, um, now, um, it, but this is the reason that these four other columns is the demand for um, people, let's say, who are born in uh, Mexico for, uh, who are married to us, uh, married to lawful permanent residents. Those folks have to wait they have to have been gotten into line before November of 2018. So their line is, is two years longer. And the reason for that is the demand for um, immigrant visas from people who are born in Mexico is so high that um, the 25,000 gets used up um, and they just run out of Mexican visas, visas from Mexican natives. So that's, that's, that's how that works. Um, the employment preferences sometimes can be um, an option um, it depends, but notice that um, uh, it depends also, again, on the demand for
other than India or China, um, C means current. Hiroshi, I'm not sure if it's just me, but your um, sound was cutting in and out and you seem to be frozen. Okay, I think Hiroshi will probably rejoin shortly. Are we back? I just, I'm not sure what happened. Can yes, hi, okay, now we can hear you. Okay. Um, okay, um, I'm not sure exactly where we were. I mean, but it was um, the, the family-based references have these lines um, based on demand for countries. And I just went through um, how the lines are longer. Um, and you're seeing here, this troop employment as well, that the lines are longer for people who are, um, have, uh, essentially first preference employment from who were born in China or in India. Um, so, you know, when, and, and, Bro, and she, yeah. Sorry, we, we lost your screen share as well. So we don't have the presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let me, um, how do I do that? Um, hang on a second. Um, That work? Yep, perfect. Okay, that's good. This is why they say power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Um, okay, um, I got just a little bit more um, on how to get in the country. Okay, um, there's there's a there's a lottery also that you may have heard of. Um, the lottery is. Um, This is also so-called diversity lottery. This is also a possibility. Um, this is a, a application um, once a year, and, and um, there are people who are essentially lottery winners. Um, and um, it prefers um, uh, countries that are not uh, so-called high admission countries. So there are a lot of countries that for which there are a lot of immigrants coming to the United States that are not eligible for this. Um, and uh, but. Um, but but of course a lot of countries are eligible and it's been um a source of uh, actually in re in in recent decades it was not I, honest, honestly it was not originally used to do what i think a lot of people think of diversity it was originally used to um to actually maintain the level of european immigration but over the years it's it's really become a a, a method to um for example i mean the the degree of um, it's been a really important vehicle for um, significant increases in uh, African immigrants to the United States is through, through the diversity lottery program. So let me pause here and see what questions you have because um, you know now we're like we're now into almost like early October of the fall semester and um, and I probably was confusing you on something. So so um, I still can't see the. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so maybe there were a couple from earlier, but maybe I'll just group uh, some of the family related okay. questions. Um, there was well, there was one question earlier about fees. Are there any fees attached to parents who naturalize and happen to have children? My parents naturalized when I was in early high school, and I remember my parents waiting to pay a fee to receive documentation of my citizenship because of the high cost. Yeah, I mean, there are fees basically for everything, practically. Um, <laughs> and uh, there are waivers for some, but not all things. Um, Part of the problem, this is just a policy aside, is that Congress decided to uh, require USCIS, the, the agency that, that decides of these applications, to make it uh, basically funded through these fees, and so it's it's uh, it, it's or significant part of their 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 budget comes that way, and so as a, as a practical matter, they charge a lot of money, and I think it's a real barrier to a lot of people. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, does a case go faster if multiple citizens petition for a parent or does it not matter? 
that doesn't matter that doesn't that doesn't matter and um but 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 you could if you file employment and and, and family you know you, you, that there'd be multiple applications you're increasingly chances that one will move faster than the other but but um you have to pay a, 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 a different fee Another question. If the stepchild is over 21, is there a way for them to legally enter with mom and stepdad? Um, not with, because they wouldn't be a child anymore, because they'd be, they wouldn't be unmarried and under 21. There may be independent reasons, um, but basically they're on their own. Um, what happens if Charles does not naturalize and Doris's child turns 21? Is that child an LPR? Can they get work authorization? Um, in that situation, so Charles is not naturalized. Doris comes in, um, but then the Charles, the child would maybe not understand the question, but the child, the child would still be um, in any, you know, I can't imagine that that the light be they be in line so long. The child would would be you know fifteen years. Well, um, in the particular case of family two A, um, let me just mention one thing which I didn't mention, which is really important. Um, this reminds me of is I'm going back to the family preference. Look at the line for if you're a brother or sister of U.S. citizen. This is a lot the, the 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 column at the bottom here. Those folks, if you're if you are a brother or sister of U.S. citizen and you're born in the Philippines, you're now getting your green card if you're waiting 21 years. So uh, when I said that the you know Doris wouldn't be in line for 20. Uh, for, for until you know for 15 years I mean I was speaking a little too quickly in the sense that I, I did not mean to imply that some of these lines aren't horrendously long they're really long lines so siblings the, the, some of these lines for siblings and for um for married daughters and, and sons of U.S. citizens are very long um so I just want to remind people that that um Doris was looking at a wait of a few years but um some of these lines are very long so let me let me go back to the question in the context of here. Um, so the child would be, um, if, if, Doris, if Doris came in the family 2A, then they, she would get a green card and the child would come with, then that would be fine. Now, if the child did not come with, let's say Doris comes in, but let's say the child is in school living with grandparents or something like that in Kenya and wants to come over later, that would be a problem if the, if the child didn't come over until the child turned 21. Um, because at that point, they no longer be a child. So they couldn't, they couldn't come along with Doris. Um, and um, they, all, she, they also wouldn't be a child for the purpose of being Charles's child. Okay. Um, so there's three more uh, visa family related care uh, questions. Um, does the F1 mean the unmarried son or daughter over 21? And if under 21, then fall into the unlimited immediate relatives category? Yeah, that's exactly right. The F1 category is for unmarried sons and daughters. The reason they're not children is over 21. If they were unmarried and, and under 21, they'd be children and not have to stand in line. Okay, two more questions. How often does the visa bulletin update or change? Is it a regular update? Every month. Um, and if you go on the State Department website, you'll see that the one for July is already available and you can, you, 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 it's available before it, it takes effect on July 1st. So every month it comes out. Okay. And then last family related question, if U.S. citizens, permanent residents can petition for siblings, can they petition for parents? Would that be a longer wait? This is for U.S. citizens petitioning for parents? Uh, it says U.S. citizen slash permanent resident, so maybe for both categories. Okay, well, a U.S. citizen who is over 21, who is 21 or older, U.S. citizen who is 21 or older can petition for a parent. That parent would be an immediate relative. Um, a U.S. citizen, uh, for a permanent resident, there is no category of preference. There is no category for parents of lawful permanent residents. So um, a person who is a permanent resident and wants to petition for a parent um, would have to um, naturalize first, and then they could file immediate relative petition. Um, and uh, by the way, there's no line for immediate relatives, but um, there is a processing backlog, right? So you can go to the USCIS Citizenship and Immigration Services website, and there'll be a tab for processing times, and you have to know the number of the form uh, that's uh, that you're waiting the processing for, and you have to know the office that's going to process it. 
and then it'll give you uh, how long the wait is as a general rule. There are going to be cases where where some take longer, but that's the that's the general setup. So those are the questions on the first part here. Um, there are a few questions that were they're not family related, but did you want to go back to oh one actually one more family based question came in. Um, can a U.S. citizen apply for a family-based petition for a deported parent whose ban time has lapsed? Um, yes. In other words, I'll get into that. But the short answer is that people who are deported are um, not eligible to come back. Um, they could get a waiver of that, or they can wait it out. And after the period of ineligibility passes, they can then come back in on the same basis as if they'd never been deported. Um, and then there were two, did you want to do two more questions? I think one of these is a pretty quick one. Okay, let's do two questions and then we'll take a five minute break. Um, okay. That, that's, that's about the right time to do that. Okay. okay, there was an earlier question, which I think will be addressed later. It says, can you lose citizenship because of crime? Um, short answer is, is no, uh, in the sense that you can be deported if you're not a citizen. But once you're a citizen, you cannot be deported unless uh, you lose your citizenship first. Um, and that could be either if you intend to basically renounce your citizenship or if um, you're denaturalized due to a discovered defect in the process by which you became a citizen. But generally that's the biggest difference. A lot of people think of citizenship, the big advantage is, is being able to vote, but actually the probably the most concrete uh, and, and heartfelt uh, advantage is you can't be deported. Um, and then the last question from earlier was, if the United States recognizes dual citizenship, why are immigrants required to relinquish their citizenship? Um, because they haven't updated the oath. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, there's a, there's, 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 a there, this is a sort of the reverse of the case I mentioned earlier. I mean, the citizenship oath talks about renunciation of, of the United States, citizenship of the United States talks about renunciation of citizenship, but uh, um, but in fact, it, it's it's really depends on the law of the other country um, uh, whether that renunciation is recognized. In effect, uh, and that's and that's uh, in some countries recognize renunciation when you become a U.S. citizen, and other countries say no, you're still you're still one of um, you know our citizens. So let's do this. Um, it's uh, if you're in Pacific time zone, it's one o five. You know, if in if 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 in you're in Europe, it's ten o five p.m. Um, let's take a break for five minutes, um, and um, and then we'll reconvene, and um, and then and then and then uh, go through the second half of this. Okay. See you in five minutes. Thanks, Roshi. I'll just leave the Zoom going. Okay.
Okay, I think we're back. Um, Grace, thank you for for consulting the questions like this. That really makes things just work a lot better than. Yeah. Working. Sure, uh, happy to help. Really, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so um, we got here is um, go on to see if I can. Um, so you know, let's talk about um, humanitarian pathways because I, I, I didn't mention that at all um, in terms of how people come to the United States. I mean, there's family, there's employment, and there's the lottery, but then there's also humanitarian pathways. Um, and, and I think we've been seeing a lot of this in the news lately. Um, so just give you an overview of this. And again, I'll stop for, for Q&A at some point um, in, after a few slides. But you know, there's also there's overseas refugee programs. In other words, there are people who are chosen worldwide um, uh, who are outside the United States and who um, apply um, and have come to the United States on that basis. The so-called overseas refugees, even though they may not actually be across an ocean, uh, what happens is that the the statute, federal statute, says that there are um, there's an annual ceiling, um, and in the last two fiscal years, it's been 125,000 a year. Um, historically, it's been close to that amount. Um, the Trump administration reduced it to 15,000 um, in 2020, and um, basically um, really tried to, um, you know, frankly, gut gut the program. And um, it's 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 uh, the Biden administration has tried to restore to what it had been in prior administrations, Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, but um, these numbers, these are ceilings, and the um, it's been very difficult for um, this, this administration, the current administration, to actually process and get through, um, you know, really bring people to the United States. Um, and 125,000, of course, is a very, very small number compared to the number of people who um, are are displaced um, for various reasons, um, no matter how narrowly or how broadly you define refugees. Um, there are people who get asylum and they apply for asylum and you but to apply for asylum you have to be at the border or you have to be inside the united states what's going on with that um the trump administration relied on a public health statute to essentially do what it could to close the border um there were exceptions and the border wasn't fully closed but it was largely closed to a lot of people um in many respects, it was closed um, on the southern border of the United States um, and made it impossible to apply for asylum. Um, there are other measures that the Trump administration adopted um, and to some extent carried over to the Biden administration that made it difficult to apply for asylum, even apart from Title 42. Um, so the Title 42 border closure ended in, in, in May, I mean, several weeks ago, not that long ago, but um, with the declared end of the of the of the public health emergency that had been, that had been actually been used as, a, as by the Trump administration as the reason to close the border. Um, but the Biden administration um, has imposed new restrictions on access to the asylum system. Um, and um, and so that's, that's a lot of what you've been uh, hearing about. Um, and it has been using, it requiring people to use an app to get appointments. The appointments are very hard to get. Uh, people have been trying for months to get these appointments. If you if you come to the border without an without an app uh, without an appointment through the app, um, you're presumed to not be eligible for there. The, I don't want to get into the technical details of this, but it's basically that the Title of 42 restrictions have been replaced by other restrictions that are uh, significant um, and are are allowing a few people to apply for asylum, uh, but makes it impossible for others to to do so. Um, and um, Another possibility here is a temporary protected status. Um, it is a status that is available on a country by country basis for people already in the United States um, when something uh, bad happens in their home country. So you're there in the United States and there's a natural disaster or a civil war um, um, and um, other disorder in, in that country. Uh, those people can be, the country can be designated for temporary protected status and people will be allowed to stay uh, in two-year increments, which can be renewed. Some people have had temporary protected status for several decades. Other people have gotten it recently. Um, and um, this is um, this is one of the ways that um, it's 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 different from asylum. But, um, 
it requires people to be here in the United States, um, but it's on a country by country basis rather than asylum, which is on an individual application basis, where, by the way, um, having the help of a lawyer is absolutely pivotal uh, in, in navigating the stages of, of that and, and qualifying under, the, under a very complex law. Now, um, one of the things the Biden administration did um, to, it said, offset the restrictions on asylum that I mentioned up, up, up um, the Title 42 border, border closure ended, but new restrictions on access to asylum system. Um, at the same time as the Biden administration imposed ex restrictions on access to the asylum system, it also um, opened up a possibility of offering parole to certain countries. Now, what is parole? Parole is temporary entry into the United States um, without being formally admitted. In other words, we'll let you in, um, typically in increments of a couple of years or a year, depends on the program. But um, for a period of time, it could even be shorter. It, 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 it could be longer. Um, it's, we're going to let you in temporarily um, without formal admission. Um, and uh, this typically makes you eligible to work. Um, but we're not going to give you asylum. Um, we're not going to give you a green card. We're just going to uh, basically um, allow you to, to stay. So the Biden administration cut off access to the asylum system, but at the same time, it opened up programs for people from um, Nicaragua, um, Cuba, Venezuela, and Haiti to apply for parole from outside the United States. And so the political trade-off, the way they're sort of touting this system is we're cutting off asylum, but we were trying to get people to uh, apply for protection by applying for parole outside the United States. This, however, um, is also restricted in its own way. It's just limited to four, four um, countries. Um, and, um, and this is also a program that requires uh, essentially you to have a U.S. financial sponsor and a valid passport and travel, uh, pay for travel to the United States. So it's not exactly the same sort of thing that um, it's not exactly universal for people from four countries and it's only for the four countries. Uh, the only thing I'll add here is that um, parole has historically been used quite a bit. Um, it's not a new thing. Um, it, parole has been used for the last 70 years, 70, 80 years since World War II, really to fill in gaps in the asylum system. Um, and so it was first used um, really back in the Truman administration, Eisenhower, um, it was used in the wake of the Cuban revolution. So this is not a, it's an informal process, but it's one that's frequently been used. Um, victims and survivors of, of, of crimes and trafficking are also eligible for green cards through a process of um, U visas and T visas. Um, and some of you may be working on, on this as well, because it's also, um, it's it's a way, it's it's a sort of a form of humanitarian protection. It's it's kind of like asylum, I guess, in that sense. It's for people, uh, most of the people are going to be in the United States. Um, and and so they're protected um, if they, um, this is really a, um, to offer um, this in, in a sense, exchange for, for helping law enforcement. They may be leading to non-permanent resident status eventually. It depends on each one. Okay. Um, now, um, I should mention non-immigrants. We're still talking about people coming into the country, non-immigrants. Um, these examples are fairly intuitive of um, tourists and uh, business visitors, students, temporary workers. There are certain visas that are available based on the treaty between your the, the, the non-citizens country and the United States. Um, some of these categories are numerically limited. In other words, temporary workers, the number is limited every year. In fact, that Demand is so high compared to supply of these is that there's a lottery uh, for that. Uh, others are unlimited. There's no there's no um, there's no cap on the number of students uh, in the United States. Um, although as a psychological matter, I mean you're always going to find consular officers who think there are too many students and that kind of thing and are strict. But but basically there is no formal cap, um, and they may lead to permanent residence through a process called adjustment of status. Okay, so in other words. Um, in other words, a non-immigrant, someone could come in as a non-immigrant and possibly become an immigrant later. The difficulty is that um, a lot of times um, when non-immigrant visas are, are, are requested um, and um, and uh, the, if the suspicion is the person really wants to stay permanently, uh, depending on the category, there there may be reluctance to grant the visa uh, because they're saying, wait a minute, you're not really a non-immigrant. You want to be an immigrant. You're just using this to kind of... Um, get in while you're waiting in line. We're not going to let you do that. Um, there's a lot of detail that I'm glossing over there, but 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 um, that can be a reason why you can't just become a non-immigrant non and then become an immigrant. Um, 
procedures are important here because you have to qualify as a category, right? Like a family 2A or immediate relative or whatever, but usually through a petition. You must not be inadmissible. In other words, there are people who are barred, even if they qualify in a category. I'll get into why they might be barred in a second. And then you, even if you're not inadmissible, then you must be admitted in a status or changed to it. In other words, so you have to qualify in a category, you must not be barred, and you must find a process by which you can get the green card. Uh, and getting that process is actually a little more complicated than it seems that you might think. Uh, and I'll get to an example of that in a second. Um, if you want to become a permanent resident, um, you can be admitted as a permanent resident from outside the country. Another is you can come in as a temporary worker and adjust status inside the United States. So again, um, you could you could have a situation where someone comes in as a non-immigrant, adjust status, goes from temporary worker to permanent resident. You could have a situation where someone comes in as a permanent resident. They don't go through adjustment status. They go through what's called consular processing. So people get green cards basically through consular processing or by adjustment of status. Um, you can all, and if you, there are also people who change non-immigrant statuses. There are plenty of people who come in as students and then get jobs and then, then, and then they become temporary workers. It's called a change of status. Um, but you've really got to, um, you know, look at processing backlogs at, um, at USCIS offices and at consulates outside the country because those, um, those, um, those matter here. Um, through a miracle of um, learning a little bit more about. Um, Zoom, I can now see the chat. I can, I, the, I can now see the, um, so um, work authorization, yeah, I mean, we, uh, parole, um, you know, most cases will come with eligibility for work authorization based on, on financial need. Um, why do we limit the number? Uh, 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 tourist visas are not limited in number. So um, they may be, you may be thinking about something else. Um, um, Grace, are there other questions I'm missing? I, I think I'm looking at both the Q&A and the chat. Um, yeah, I think those are all the ones that I see as well. Or, yeah, I, I didn't put up that slide. So let me give you a second to um, get a drink of water and you can see if you have any questions about. Let me do this. Let me move on. Um, and then then I can, and then I'll be, there'll be another question slide in a minute and we can get to that. Um, Inadmissibility. Okay, so I've talked about how you can fit in the category, but still can't you'll still be barred. In other words, you'll still be inadmissible. Um, so, what are examples of this? Um, examples. Well, I mean, the public charge. If you don't have enough financial support, you can be uh, barred. If you, that that means you can't get it. You don't have a financial sponsor. Um, okay. Uh, if you've been in the country, United States, unlawfully in the past, you may be barred. I'll give you an example of this in just a second, but just bear with me until I get to the example in a minute. But the main thing I want to do now is say there is a penalty for having been in the country unlawfully, and that penalty may be that you're barred. And exactly how that works, I'll get to in a minute. You could be barred because of criminal convictions in, in, your, in your home country, or possibly in this country if you leave and come back. Um, there, there are national security reasons why you could be barred. Um, there's a whole, whole complicated and very, very comprehensive and even, even um, redundant list of, of, of quasi or associated with terrorism type activities in, in the language of the statute. Um, you can get um, you can get waivers to some of these grounds, not all of them, but many of them you can. So you can get prior unlawful presence. The penalty for that can be waived, um, and you can get waives for some crimes. So let me give you a scenario here that illustrates both the inadmissibility grounds, but also the process by which people get green cards, and in fact serves as a recap of everything we've done um, for the last hour and 15 minutes, or in, in, in real time, we'd be doing this in mid to late October, and it'd be a recap of everything we've done since August 21st. Okay, Emiko um, was in the United States in 2015. At that time, she was admitted as a tourist for three months, but she stayed for eight months and left on her own. Okay. Part one of the story. Part two, 11 months ago, she was admitted as a tourist again. Um, it, the fact that she had stayed for eight, um, eight months 
apparently was not tracked or not known when she was readmitted. And she stayed for three months of admission, but she hasn't left. So she's overstayed by eight months and she's been working without permission. So she just married a US citizen. And she became a lawful permanent resident. Okay. Very, very typical case. Um, and think about this, not just in these specific facts. How many people are in the United States without lawful status who marry a US citizen and now want to get a green card and believe that because they're immediate relative, they can get a green card? Well, they're entitled to a green card in the sense that there's a line. There's no line, actually. There, 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 there is no line. They just are eligible. But how they actually go about it. Okay, here's, here's, here's the problem. One problem is the penalty I mentioned for being in the country unlawfully, because she was unlawfully in the country for five months the first time. In other words, she was admitted for three and stayed for eight. So that's five. Um, and then she was also admitted 11 months ago. She was only supposed to stay three, but she stayed, she's been staying 11 and counting. So she has one unlawful stay of five months and, and the second one of eight months. Um, she's eligible as a media relative, but what's the deal with the unlawful presence? Okay, let's talk about this. Um, we're going to dive into the statute here a little bit, and partly because um, I just want to illustrate, give you an example of how the statute's written. Okay, um, I've highlighted the parts that um, uh, that uh, that really matter here. Um, and but anyway, this is section. Um, uh, 212A of the uh, Immigration Nationality Act, um, also known as 8 United States Code 1182, but that's the example of the two separate numbering systems. By the way, when you read court decisions, you tend to get the AUS numbers, but immigration lawyers tend to use the INA numbers, but that's just how the two cultures are using two different languages to mean the same thing. Okay, well, the, the yellow highlighting um, is um, if you're unlawfully present in the United States for 180 days, but less than a year, in other words, um, or eight months, for example, um, you cannot come back if you seek admission within three years of the date of your departure or removal, right? This is the so-called three-year bar or between 180 days and a year of unlawful presence, um, after your departure or removal, you cannot, you cannot come back for three years. Um, if you've been unlawfully present in the United States for one year or more, I'm going down to the, the small room numeral two here, one year or more, and you again seek admission within 10 years of departure or removal, you cannot come back. So this is the 10 year bar. So it really matters if you've been unlawfully present in the United States for between 180 days and 365, or if you've been unlawfully present for over a year. Of course, many people who are undocumented in the United States have been in the United States unlawfully for more than a year, often well more than a year. Um, and so this, they're looking at the possibility of a 10 year, 10 year bar. Um, you can get waivers. Um, the waivers are restricted to people. This is in subsection Roman numeral, small Roman numeral five of 212A. It's just a continuation of the prior slide of 212. Um, the waiver is if you're a spouse, son, or daughter of a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, um, and you can show extreme hardship um, to this qualifying relative, um, you can get a waiver. Discretionary. No court will review it um, the, 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 regarding the waiver that exercises discretion, but at least this possibility of a waiver. Um, okay. Now, um, but notice that if I go back to if I go back to this 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 slide, oh, I'm sorry. If I go back to this slide. Notice that this refers to departure removal. So, Emiko would trigger the three year bar or the ten year bar if she leaves the country. Now, two things. One is that, is she subject to the three-year bar or the 10-year bar? Turns out the three-year bar because she was in lawful, unlawfully in the country for five months and then eight months. The key is you do not combine them. And uh, that is an interpretation that the government has actually issued, uh, issued on its own some years ago 
it, it comes from the actual meaning of the, the statute and comparing it to exactly how they allowed aggregate aggregation and, and did not allow aggregation in other circumstances. And so um, she is subject to a three-year bar for having been unlawfully in the United States for an eight-month eight period. The five-month period does not count for this, for this purpose. Okay, so, um, but notice that, um, notice that the thing is that if she leaves the country, she then triggers the three-year bar. Can she become a permanent resident without leaving the country? If she does, she can avoid this problem. That means that she cannot counsel the process, or if she does get counsel the process, she needs a waiver, right? So she has two options. One is leave the country, get a waiver. If she doesn't get the waiver, she's stuck outside the country for three years. The other option is for her to get a green card without leaving the country, and then she doesn't have to worry about this problem. So then the question is, can Emiko adjust status? And that's what this is, adjustment of status. Okay. Um, let's see here, adjustment of status. So here's the adjustment of status statute. Okay, I, I told you this was gonna be technical. Um, and as I said, I'm not doing this because um, you need to know all this in detail. I just wanna illustrate what a typical um, real life problem for a lot of people who are trying to get green cards would look like and how you would explain the answer. Okay, so she can if she can get a green card in, inside the United States without leaving, then she doesn't have to worry about the three and 10 year bars, but that requires her to adjust status. And there's a statute 245 of the Immigration Nationality Act that dictates eligibility to adjust status. Okay, the first thing is you have to be inspected and admitted or paroled. This means that um, Emiko is fine on this basis because she was admitted as a tourist. It also means if you're paroled in, uh, like the the new program that the Biden administration has for these for these, these these particular countries, then you're okay. But if you cross the border surreptitiously, if if you basically are entered without inspection, as they say, if you're an EWI, e um, then you're not eligible for adjust status. Um, so that's you know that that basically is a way of saying that some immigration violations, like an overstay, is less serious than than being an EWI. Um, so there's a lot of discussion we could have about that, which I won't get into now for the sake of time, but it treats some violations as, as worse than others. Um, she's she's okay uh, with inspected and admitted. Um, she is eligible to receive an immigrant visa because she's an immediate relative. We know that from 20 slides ago. Um, and so it's immediately available because she's an immediate, immediate relative. Okay. Now, but this is section C of um, Subsection C of 245. Subsection C says, subsection A, which is the adjustment eligibility grounds, shall not be applicable to, and notice that the, the, the bottom here, the, the big, the two and a half line, two lines I have, I have highlighted at the end, it basically says if you work without, without authorization, without, prior to filing an application for adjustment, or who is in unlawful immigration status, both of those apply to her. This basically says you, if you work, um, uh, you know, without authorization, you cannot adjust status, even if you're admitted. But there's an exemption for immediate relatives. That's the middle part here. So here's how it works in quasi plain English. Emmy Co can avoid the three and ten year bars, bars by adjusting. She would appear to be eligible by having been admitted. She, however, would appear to be ineligible because she worked without, without authorization. But it turns out she's okay because she's married to a US citizen because that makes your immediate relative. So it's an exception to the exception. As married to a US citizen, she's exempt from the bar for working unlawfully. Um, so she'd be able to get um, a green card on that basis. But this shows you how, this is the interaction of three things. What category you're in, um, what, whether you're inadmissible, and the process by which you get a green card. She's lucky that she can use a process that gets around, eventually avoids the fact that she would, would be inadmissible if she left the country. And all of it hinges on the fact that she's married to a US citizen. Okay. Um, wow. Uh, that's a lot. Um, 
Any other questions here? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll um, I don't. There's seven. Oh, is, is DACA, is the question about DACA? Oh, let's see. Yeah, there's okay. two questions, yeah. Okay, what I got here. Um, Um, the first question is whether she needs to file a waiver for having overstayed her visa or working in the United States. Um, no, I think that I think I think that that's covered within the scenario that we talked about. In other words, that she would, if she left the country, she would need a waiver, but by adjusting, she doesn't doesn't become ineligible, and therefore she doesn't need a waiver at all. Um, the it's possible it's. Okay, so so, um, in other words, um, being an immediate relative means that she can adjust status in spite of having worked unlawfully and in spite of having overstayed. And by adjusting status, um, none of the possible grounds for ineligibility can apply to her. Uh, it's not going to apply to her that she overstayed because immediate relatives can do that. It's not going to apply to her that she worked without authorization because um, because immediate relatives can do that. Um, and because she was admitted, inspected or admitted or paroled, she can adjust status without leaving the country. Um, would DACA be considered adjustment status? Is another question we got. Um, no, I'll get to that in a second, but um, let me give you an illustration, which is, this is a very important practical question. Um, for people who have DACA, um, people who have DACA and marry a US citizen, if, they're inspect if, they, if they were inspected and admitted to the United States, um, and married to a citizen, they would be in an Emico situation and they would be eligible to get a green card without leaving the country. Um, and many people, and by the way, inspected and admitted means that you went through a port of entry. Uh, there are plenty of people who were waved through, um, who were who were as infants and were in the car um, and they were let into the country. Um, and so that would be considered, that that kind of DACA recipient would, would be eligible to adjust status. Now here's the, here's the thing that's practically important. A lot of DACA recipients get have, have gotten um, and get something called advanced parole. It means that you let you come to the country, you are not inspected into the country. You're in the country without inspection. You not you would not be eligible for adjustment of status. But people in that situation can be apply for permission to leave the country and come back. That would mean that now they're back in the country in a sense after their trip, right? So they come back to the country after their trip. That paroled in from their trip, even though their first time in the United States was without inspection. Now they're eligible for adjustment of status. And there are plenty of people who have DACA, left the country, came back on parole, and then married a US citizen and then become just like Emiko. Then, then they're eligible to adjust. And the fact that they're married to a US citizen exempts them from the ineligibility based on um, having been present unlawfully or having worked unlawfully. Oh, by the way, um, many DACA recipients don't have any unlawful presence because you can only accrue unlawful presence for this particular inadmissibility ground if you're 18 years old. That's another thing that um, saves people. Okay, um, let's see. Let me, I don't see any other questions. Um, and Oh, there's actually one question that just what? came in the Q&A. Um, yeah. Do you need separate waivers for everything? For example, deported twice and came back twice, would you need to? Um, in theory, you need two waivers. Um, the reason I put it that way is that um, I honestly don't remember if the form allows you to combine them, but technically you're getting the waiver twice. Um, you'd have to look at the form. And um, I just haven't, I just don't know if there's a way that you can consolidate them. Okay, um, I got 20 minutes, so let me, um, oh, um, I got the question, the last part about DACA recipients. Um, you uh, unlawful. Um, the, what what I said um, is is just that um, you don't you do not accrue unlawful presence if you're unless you're unless you're 18 years old. So um, if you've been in the country unlawfully um, uh, and all that time was under 18, for the purpose of this three and 10 year bars, you are um, those that time doesn't count. Um, there's another provision where time under 18 does count, and I don't have time to get into it, but it's called the permanent bar. Um, and it's in subsection C, right below subsection B, and subsection B is the one I just showed you, so you can look that up. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to go through here, and I now realize that um, I probably will go till two o'clock um, Pacific. But okay, let's let's talk about. Um, okay, so some this part actually is going to go a little. Some of this is going to go a little quicker. Um, you know, the, the removal proceedings, removal proceedings are properly known as deportation proceedings uh, and detention. Some people don't get full hearings. I mean, there's expedited removal if you show up at the border. Um, sometimes you can be sent right back. Um, sometimes people have been removed before and the government will just reinstate the prior order without giving you a full hearing. And in Los Angeles and other in other courts, there's, there's something called dedicated dockets, which is really... Um, a way uh, um, we've done a study of this in my clinic and and at the at, at SILP at the our center at UCLA um, is is is, is that there's some serious due process issues with just basically ramming these cases through court without in a timeline that doesn't give people a chance to you know um, make their cases. Um, there's also detention issues when someone who's in immigration court there's issues of detention. You can be in detention pending the removal hearing. In other words, while your case is going on. Some some people are mandatorily detained per statute. Um, particularly, uh, people with committed um, with certain critical. Most people actually with criminal convictions um, are subject to these. Well, I shouldn't say most statistically because I don't have numbers to cite. But um, many people with criminal convictions are ineligible for, for bond, basically. Um, and then um, and then there are people who are. Um, who are detained for a long detention, like they may be appealing their appealing their cases. They may be, you know, more. Um, uh, there are people um, in the ACLU, uh, you know, so of uh, Southern California, but also um, um, my now faculty co-director Ahilan, and also ACLU nationally has, has been very much at the forefront of litigating cases to contest uh, the legality of detention, um, mandatory and prolonged. There's also people who are um, who are been ordered deported, but in fact cannot be deported, they may be stateless or their home country won't take them back, um, things like that. And they could be in detention, which is kind of a euphemism for the fact that this is actually prison. Um, removal proceedings in immigration court, issues in immigration court often um, will include, well, they do include things like this. Will you be detained? Um, are you inadmissible or inadmissible? Um, in other words, if you show up the border, the issue is gonna be, are you, Admissible? Are we going to let you in? If you're inside already, um, if you've been admitted, are you deportable? For example, you could have been admitted even as a permanent resident. If you commit a crime, you might be deportable. Um, even if you're admissible or deportable, inadmissible or deportable, um, you might say, I realize I'm supposed to, according to the letter of the law, uh, be taken out of the country, but there are some provisions that allow me to stay uh, and they exercise your discretion. And so that's called remove, relief removal. There's also a lot of due process issues involved in immigration court, of course. There is no right to appointed counsel in general. It's not like a public defender system. Um, but Padilla versus United States is, is a, um, Padilla versus Kentucky actually is a United States Supreme Court decision from 2010. And it basically says you have a right to effective assistance of counsel in your criminal proceedings. And it's possible that you can go back and undo your criminal conviction if you were not given um, the requisite um, accuracy of advice in your criminal court. And so it raises the possibility that the crime that you committed um, can be um, basically erased for immigration purposes um, based on um, the inadequacy of your criminal representation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, substantively, I want to go through deportability, which is, I mentioned, well, here's a scenario, right? This is the last scenario I've got. Um, France was convicted, was admitted to the United States um, in 2013. Um, by the way, it doesn't say here how he's admitted, but let's just assume he was admitted as a permanent resident in the United States. I should correct that before I distribute these slides. He committed theft in 2018 and was convicted later the same year, right? So he's been a permanent resident um, for about five years, and then he was convicted of theft that he committed um, earlier the same year in 2018. He was sentenced to six months and two years in prison with um, all but six months of the sentence suspended. Okay. Um, is he deportable? Um, that's the question for you. Okay, um, how do you deal with it? So this obviously forces you to look at why people can become deportable and the statute says that. 
Okay, admitted non-citizens may become deportable. Um, so that could be non-immigrants or who overstay or otherwise violate statutes. So it could be permanent residents um, who become deportable, um, for example, by committing a crime. Um, deportability would be, you know, um, crimes. These are three categories of crimes, which I'll get to in just a second. You have to think about what it means to be convicted. Um, you know, how does, how does, you know, deferred adjudication, deferred, deferred sentencing work? Um, and another issue is, um, is what does it mean to be sentenced? Because France was given a two-year sentence, but uh, apparently only served six months. So how does that work? Okay. You could get waivers of deportability under some circumstances. You could also do post-conviction relief, which is withdraw a guilty plea um, and start all over in, in criminal court. Um, okay, so um, another issue which I want to flag, um, and it could be its own two-hour segment, is what's the degree of state and local operation with Department of Homeland Security, and in particular with Immigration and Customs Enforcement? Are you in a state with sanctuary, sanctuary type provisions, or are you in a state where local and state um, police are cooperating closely with ICE? Okay, so that's another variable here, practically. Portability based on convictions. Um, so um, this also is something I promised I'd get to earlier when I discussed uh, or answered the question, what kinds of crimes would make you, make you um, ineligible to naturalize? Well, 237 is a deportability statute, and you can be deported for crimes involving moral turpitude if they're committed within five years of admission. Um, and the conviction, conviction of a crime for which the sentence is one year or longer. Well, we know the crime could be penalized for more than one year because it's actually sentenced to two years with, with, with most of it suspended. Uh, did he commit the crime within five years? Well, we don't know yet because we know the difference is between 2018 and 2013, but we don't know what time of year. So it's possible it's been five years. It's possible that it's not. Um, it's possible that, um, so that's gonna, that's just a factual inquiry. Of course, in many cases, um, you just don't know the facts, right? And you have to just make sure you know the facts um, um, and get the documents to prove the facts. Um, Okay, and then multiple criminal convictions, um, um, that's the other highlighting, we don't have that. Here, um, aggravated felony, this is interesting, aggravated felony is if you're convicted of aggravated felony any time after admission, you're deportable. So it's a lifetime deportability situation, and it's one where you might be looking at post-conviction relief as the only way to deal with it. Um, definitions, okay, this is 101. I promise I've mentioned 101 as a, as a statute dealing with um, definitions. 101 defer, defines aggravated felony, a subsection uh, 101A43. So we, you know there are at least 42 other terms defined here. Um, it includes a burglary offense or theft offense of which a term of imprisonment at least one year. Uh, turns out Congress in its haste to enact this provision forgot to put a verb in, um, but this is usually read to mean a term of imprisonment of, of at least is at least one year. Well, the term of imprisonment is at least one year. It's a theft offense. Um, and that suggests it is an aggravated felony. So that's the biggest problem that, that France has, um, subject to the possibility of post-conviction relief. Um, it, it, he's been convicted, we're told that, but this is just a, a definition you have to look at if you're dealing with someone who has a deferred sentencing or deferred adjudication. Um, it depends really on what he admits to and what the judge finds. Um, and, um, but the one that's relevant to this France problem is um, it, this says that suspensions are not, um, that if you had, in this case, two years of sentence and served only six months, that 18 months still counts against you. That's what this last, last piloted thing says. Um, it's, it, you count the sentence regardless of any suspension. Okay. So again, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, it suggests that you need to remember this as much as this is just the illustration of how you dig in to investigate the facts um, and then apply the law to the facts. Defenses to removal. Uh, there's something called cancellation removal. It is for people who, um, it's a general statute that says, in spite of everything else, let me stay. Um, there are a lot of requirements and uh, both for threshold eligibility and for the facts you need to prove. Um, that, of course, is also defined. There's separate provisions for permanent residents and for other for others. Um, you could say that to the court, um, 
I am deportable, but I claim asylum now, not as a way to get into the country, uh, as what we talked about earlier today, but because something's happened, let's say you're in the country and you um, you overstay, but it turns out that there's been a change of government in your country and uh, you belong to a group of people who have been persecuted, um, maybe a political party, then you could apply for asylum to prevent deportation. Um, okay, asylum, you could get something that's milder protection, but um, um, you might be eligible for something that's not as good as asylum, but it's at least doesn't um, get you deported to that country. It's called withholding of removal. There's something also that protects you against um, torture, convention against torture. It could be that you can um, apply for a temporary protected status. There's also prosecutorial discretion. Um, DACA is a program of prosecutorial discretion. Um, that's why people get DACA first, and then in the time they have DACA, it's possible they can get a green card. Um, but because it's not a green card, this is the reason that there's a strong need for congressional action on this. There's also general deferred action on a case-by-case -case basis, and there's also administrative closure, which is cases that are regarded as different. Um, uh, um, this, this is the case that are regarded as so low priority that they basically take you off the books of the immigration court. Okay, um, I have the next slide here has questions, but I think it makes more sense if I just go through my last few slides to the end and then come back to any questions about this and anything else just to, um, okay. I'll go through this pretty quickly because this is gonna be pretty superficial, but um, there are a lot of players here and sometimes you really need to know who's making the decisions. This is the federal executive branch, obviously there's a president. Um, I'll just scroll through this while I get a drink of water. Um, okay. Homeland Security has a uh, number of different units. USCIS adjudicates petitions and applications, including for waivers inside the United States. Um, these are all general rules, by the way. There are a lot of things that get adjudicated by other groups, but that's generally true. Um, ICE is the people who do the enforcing. Um, they arrest people, um, you know, um, um, are in charge of of uh, detention with private contractors. Um, Customs Border Protection is people uh, at the ports of entry, airports, um, border crossings, and the Border Patrol. Um, our executive Office for Immigration Review is the immigration court system, which has the immigration courts individually, but also an administrative agency called the Board of Immigration Appeals that takes appeals from the individual judges. The Attorney General sits on top of that entire structure. The Department of State handles things at embassies and consulates overseas. Um, they're usually in charge of issuing visas and to some extent some waiver situations. The Department of Labor is involved in certifying that um, people coming to the country will uh, not take the jobs away from or reduce the wages of working conditions of, of, um, of uh, U.S. workers. Um, federal courts. Um, you know, a lot of these situations arise in federal court. Um, there, there's been a lot of action in the district courts lately because um, well, this part isn't new, but release from detention is often sought in a, in a, in a district court on habeas. Um, but district court is also where people go to challenge what the executive branch is doing. Um, so right now, what you're having is a lot of, um, especially the state of Texas is filing lawsuits in federal district courts um, to try to block what the Biden administration is doing. Um, and the practice is merged of going to court where there's only one judge. So you know which judge you're going to get. That judge is someone who you think is going to be sympathetic to your case. Um, the state of Texas, often it's a Trump appointed judge. And then that judge issues a nationwide injunction to block the Biden policy. Um, the, um, when Trump was president, something similar happened, but not to the degree um, and um, that is, has been happening lately. But this is a big issue is allowing um, federal district courts to issue in one district to issue injunction to block a nationwide policy. Courts of appeals get involved. Um, they're the place you appeal removal orders called petitions to remove. So if you get an order from immigration judge for removal, you could end up with an appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals. But if you lose there, you go to um, courts of appeals um, and appeals from other decisions, of course, um, in individual cases, um, not just removal orders, but some some petition denials and things like that. And it's the Court of Appeals. And then, of course, the Supreme Court, which hasn't been um, uh, very in the current configuration, very sympathetic to immigration law and immigrant rights issues on the on the immigrant side. Um, 
Last thing I'll do, and then you know, I'll have five more questions left, five more minutes left for questions I see um, in the chat, is the, um, this is something that I'll mention. Um, and um, this is obviously, this is a selective list. Um, I listed the case book I'm a co-author on and, and taken the speaker's prerogative to list my own case book and, and not uh, list the others, but um, there are a bunch of other case books and um, they're all actually quite good for different reasons. I think they reflect different teaching philosophies, but um, but I think, but but um, but you can read certainly about everything I've talked about um, in this case book. Um, um, Richard Boswell's book, Essential of Immigration Law, is really a, a good sort of a a primer on immigration law. It's 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 simpler, but not oversimplified. It's quite a good overview of, of many of these issues, and certainly it gets into more detail than I have here. Um, Kevin Johnson's book, um, Understanding Immigration Law. Kevin Johnson with his co-authors. Um, this is more like uh, you know, like understanding uh, civil procedure, or uh, is it that length of of, of, of book? Um, and um, it's kind of in between uh, the size of the case book on the long side and 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 some of the other books like um, uh, there's also a nutshell by the way I should put on here but it's um, but you know it's, it's there's a bunch of things that you can discover more more hidden but I think worth mentioning is that um, the uh, there are, uh, the treatise by Yale Air and others is part of LexisNexis and it is um, when um, if you were to look at the printed version it'd be 26 volumes of it's sort of like it's like um, it's just a it's a really 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 detailed treatise on immigration law um, if you want a weekly um, newsletter on everything happening in immigration law you look at interpreter releases which is part of Westlaw uh, and for something that's a little it's more by um, it's not as often and it's a little bit more more looking at slightly bigger picture vendors immigration bulletin which is part of LexisNexis uh, the Migration Policy Institute is a great source of reports and statistics on migration. Not the only one, but one I go to a lot. Um, I'll just mention, you know, um, Michael was kind enough at the beginning to mention a couple of my books. Um, these are things that, you know, if you want um, more of the history of how we got to where we are. Immigrants, Americans in waiting is about how America has treated immigrants and, and um, not always as Americans in waiting. And immigration outside law is sort of what it sounds like. Um, uh, it deals with undocumented migration and how that came to be. And the new migration law is the er, is the early version of the book I'm writing. Um, it's really about borders, um, but new migration law is really looking at the future of you know this whole area. Um, and the and and the thing, by the way, that I'm I probably um, has gotten me the most exposure out in the real world is that I'm the straight man in a Try Guys video called "The Try Guys Try Immigrating to America," um, which last count had over seven million views. Um, and so I mentioned that um, because there are probably not 7 million people watching this video, um, but that compresses my 42 hour, 52 hour course, not into, um, not into two hours, but instead into 15 minutes. Um, okay, so I've got a few questions here um, and, um, and I'm done with what I had prepared. Um, okay, um, let's see. Um, Okay, one question I have is, um, do aggravated felonies include drug-related convictions? Um, generally, uh, yes, but, well, no. Look, it, uh, it really depends on the situation. Um, and you're gonna have to look at the definition of aggravated felony in 101A43. Um, and you're gonna have to um, look at definition of drug-related convictions in, um, in either 212 or 237. One thing I, this question prompts me to to mention, which I think is important, is that all of this is is trying to fit a particular conviction into a statutory category. That's not as straightforward as it seems, because it turns out that um, what matters isn't the actual facts of your crime, but the statute you're convicted under. So you could be convicted. Two people can commit this, commit this, do the same thing, but. They could be convicted under two different statutes in two different states. It's possible that the outcome will depend, will differ depending on the wording of the statute of, of, of conviction. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, so, um, would Congress have to uh, have to pass? What would Congress have to pass to move immigration courts outside of? Um, 
DOJ and EOR, and, uh, they would have to actually pass a statute that said that. They would actually have to say, we're reconstituting immigration courts in a way that pulls it out of what some people believe is a conflict of interest uh, to be in the same agency, not in the same agency technically, but in the same federal government as trying to, just trying to um, um, deport you. Um, okay, there's just two more. I hope I can read them. Um, let's see. Um, is there a waiver for a deported parent um, with an, you know, I'm, I've got I've got two other questions here that I think are very fact specific um, and um, on, and so I'm not sure I want to answer them here. Um, if, um, yeah, um, I mean, they both have to do with waiting times and waivers um i can I, I feel more comfortable telling you where to find the answer um so um there's a you know this is going to seem like a like an annoying sort of answer but i mean i think you need to look like at one of the books i mentioned on waivers um for um deportability and in particular the grounds for coming back if you've been deported with an aggravated felony and um in many cases, that's going to require post-conviction relief as opposed to getting a, wa a waiver. But it's going to really depend. Um, and in terms of a, a permanent resident now, I'll get another question regarding permanent residents now. Um, and this is a person who needs to wait four years to be naturalized. Um, so this is a question of someone who's admitted to permanent resident and is waiting to naturalize. Uh, what will happen after the person naturalizes? Um, at that point, the per, the individual will have to figure out some way to adjust status because they leave the country, they would have to get a waiver. Um, adjusting status would require them to not be barred from adjustment by any of the provisions in 245C. And I, I just I refer you to that section. Um, okay, so um, we've reached 201 Pacific, and I think um, just for lack of time and to respect your need to do whatever you need to be doing, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna thank you for your attention, um, and um, you know uh, we're gonna send the slideshow out after I correct a couple things. Um, and Grace, thank you for um, for everything you've done to put this together because um, you know I think it's really important that 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 all of all of you um, watching today, your work is supported, and I hope I've tried to do that. So um, anyway, um, good luck. Thank you so much, Hiroshi. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.